Commencing transmission. Engaging scramblers. Proxy chain initialized. And now, live from this hidden base of the Earth's core, the future ruler of Earth, Doomcock. <laughs> Greetings, legionnaires, villains, rogues, vagabonds, and future subjects. I am Dictor Van Doomcock, the future ruler of Earth, and I stand here before you today to elaborate on my thoughts regarding the latest Marvel Cinematic Universe release, Avengers Infinity War. With me, as always, is my best friend and constant nemesis, the extra-dimensional eldritch god Harvey Cthulhu. How are you today, Harvey? Uh, the same as I was yesterday, wanting to escape this containment field and lay waste to your universe, the usual. And you? I've been thinking very hard about Avengers Infinity War. I know you didn't like that movie uh, from your spoiler-free review. A have you changed your mind? Infinity War is a confounding film. It's not as simple as, did I like it or not? Infinity War is not a clear-cut case. There is room for debate, and both sides can have equally compelling points. Whether you like this movie or not depends on what relative weight you assign to each criterion in your personal aesthetic. If you favor character interactions, say, over story construction. You'll love this movie because the character interactions in it are fabulous. If you're heavily into narrative theory and the plot not having any holes in it, you'll be angry at Infinity War. Doomcock weights all aesthetic elements equally. If anything is askew, Doomcock pounces on it, relentless in his quest for perfection, which is why Doomcock hates everything he sees. Everything fails to measure up to his insane standards of perfection. Therefore, Doomcock annoys everyone at one time or another. That's why he's a supervillain. Judging by some of the reactions you got, I think a lot of people disagree with you on this movie. That's perfectly fine. I want to be very clear. Just because Doomcock is taking this film apart, it is no reflection on the fans who enjoy it. I'm not calling their taste into account or trying to convince anyone not to like it. This is not bad in the way that Star Trek Discovery is bad. Star Trek Discovery is so goddamn awful that yes, I do indeed attack and question the intelligence and taste of anyone that finds that shit even remotely acceptable. Because Star Trek Discovery is a worthless abomination written by morons for morons. But Infinity War is not inherently terrible, and I think reasonable people could absolutely like it. There's plenty to love about it, and I acknowledge that. And I hope you'll extend me the same courtesy by not judging me for disliking it, as my video will show there are many things to dislike about this movie as well. And sometimes I will use harsh language in making my points, for it is Doomcock's way to be strident. Do not infer from this I despise the movie as I despise Star Trek Discovery. It's just that Doomcock doesn't do namby-pamby. If you love this movie and don't want to hear my analysis, by all means stop listening. Doomcock is not out to destroy this film as he destroyed Star Trek Discovery. I have no desire to change anyone's mind. Infinity War is a well-executed film that nevertheless is a failure on a fundamental level. As with Phantom Menace and The Force Awakens, in the midst of the massive build-up and hype, fans find it difficult to see some fairly obvious flaws in Infinity War because they're hypnotized. Uh, hypnotized? Yes, Harvey. When a film has been awaited eagerly for years, when certain films like Phantom Menace and The Force Awakens are hyped up into major pop culture events, then fans become invested in that film being not only good, but great. It's an emotional thing. They can't face the letdown if, after all that hype, the movie lets them down. 
Thus, they become hypnotized. But Doomcock is immune to hypnosis. He cannot be influenced by expectations or social media or peer pressure. Doomcock sees shit and calls it shit, even though everyone else is proclaiming it to be wonderful because for it not to be wonderful, after so much waiting and hype, is too terrible to admit. When everyone was singing the praises of The Force Awakens, Doomcock was proclaiming it a cheap rip-off and hated its guts, and got into lots of fights online with people who a year later were agreeing with him. Well, Avengers Infinity War is vastly better than The Force Awakens, have no doubt of that. But ultimately, it's as bad a failure as The Force Awakens, but for different reasons. The Force Awakens was a piece of garbage with no new ideas, and Infinity War is a well-crafted movie built on a no-win premise that ultimately ruins a huge part of the Marvel Universe. Well, that's kind of a sour grapes comment, Dictor. Yeah, a huge part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe is dead, but uh, you say that like it was a bad thing. Me, I, I thought it was a refreshing romp, uh, just a tiny taste of what my rampage would look like. Thanos is my kind of guy, the kind that kills you and says, oh, pardon me, kill, so sorry, Squish, I really regret that I must do this, Annihilate. Yeah, we'll get to that, Harvey. But let's start out with the lesser disappointments of this movie. First off, the Hulk. The Hulk shows up in the very first scene, gets his ass kicked, and then never returns. And so we get Infinity War with Hulk not only beaten, but beaten so bad he hides inside Puny Banner for the rest of the movie and refuses to come back out and play. This is a microcosm for how much Marvel has crippled their own universe with this movie. Yeah, that sucked. It was like a bully took Hulk's football away from him, and so Hulk ran home crying and won't come out of his room. That pretty much fucks up the Hulk as a character forever. Hulk was based on the premise that the matter he got, the stronger he got, going up to an ultimate level of rage as yet untapped. Kind of like you, Doomcock. Indeed. Doomcock's power lies in his bottomless well of rage. That's why Doomcock is destined to be a supervillain and not a shoe salesman or a customer service representative. Greetings. Thank you for calling Discount Appliance Superstore. How may I help you? Your what? Your washing machine was delivered with a dent in it? You fool! Why do you think we give discounts? All our appliances are dented and abused, you unmitigated imbecile! Whence the discount otherwise? You're lucky if the goddamn thing doesn't explode the first time you try to run it in a soapy gutter damarung of dirty underwear and lint, you whiny toad! How dare you offend the sacrosanct person of your master's ear with puerile whining? When you're sold a defective appliance, you'll take it and like it, or be destroyed by Doomcock. Destroyed, do you hear? Thanks for calling. Have a nice day. Uh, actually, if more customer service calls were like that, I'd call in just for fun. Say, I wonder what kind of customer service representative I'd make. Hi, my name is Harvey. How may I help you today? A dent in your washer, eh? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, you know, I, I tell you what. Come on down to our warehouse and we'll give you a replacement. Where is our warehouse? Uh, well, there's a cave in the Amazon basin. It slopes down into the ground about 200 yards and drops off to the center of the earth. Yeah, that's right, center of the earth. Uh, the rent down here is super cheap. That's why we can discount so steeply and bring the savings to you. So yeah, you, you come to that drop, you just rappel down until you hit a primordial jungle. I see where this is going. Elude the dinosaurs and the lizard people, then enter the evil-looking giant mansion built atop the still-working super science base of a race of aliens long since dead. Go down to the basement and... And to get your new washing machine, all you have to do is flip a switch on our washing machine dispensing console and voila! Another satisfied customer until he realizes he's just freed you from your containment field and Harvey Damarung commences destroying our universe. Enjoy your new washing machine, dipshit. 
How well you know me. And it is in that spirit of colossal disappointment that we have an Avengers movie without the Hulk. Hulk gets his ass kicked and hides the rest of the movie. Yeah, it's that kind of movie. And it happens in the first scene, along with Loki getting killed. Now... Going into this, I knew we'd lose a few characters, but even so, this was a very effective scene. Loki gets killed basically trying to save Thor and the universe. This was a death that I felt keenly, but basically this scene is the whole movie. After this, the entire interminable affair feels like rinse and repeat. They're going to fight Thanos and lose, repeat, as needed. Even before Thanos gets more of the Infinity Stones, Thanos is tough enough to best Thor, kick Hulk's ass, and kill Loki. It's clear that our heroes are going to need to come up with something amazingly clever to take Thanos down, because if he can treat three of the most powerful warriors in the MCU like that, combat is going to get tedious and redundant, isn't it? It is. It is, and it does. The film gets very redundant as our heroes throw everything but the kitchen sink at Thanos, pounding him in traditional superheroic ways, but almost always the same ways that have been proven not to work. Only each group of different heroes doesn't really know this, so Thanos appears, heroes attack him, and though they have to try punching and blasting him, we as the audience know just pounding him isn't the answer, and so it becomes kind of obligatory. It gets tiresome. Indeed, even Thanos' minions are nigh unto invincible, but at least those fights have a prospect of victory that keeps them from being tedious. But Marvel is counting on us having the memory of fucking flies brain-damaged from huffing furniture polish and chowing down on Tide Pods, because Marvel shows us about halfway through how powerful Thanos is and how hopeless all these repetitive battles are. At the Collector's Place, Thanos shows us that he is so powerful, he can end these battles instantly. When Drax and Mantis charge him, Thanos turns Drax into a series of sectioned blocks that break apart, and he turns Mantis into an unspooling ribbon. And when Star-Lord tries to kill Gamera at her request to save her from Thanos, Thanos makes the gun spit bubbles instead of death. The battle is over. Decisively. Now, for fuck's sake, think about this. At this point, Thanos doesn't even have all the stones, and yet he can do that to any resistance with just a thought. If he has this kind of power over reality itself, every subsequent battle where he doesn't instantly end things before the heroes have a chance to throw a punch is a lie and a cheat. He could encase everyone inside giant diamonds, If he can teleport himself and Gamera instantly, he can teleport everyone else out into space or into the heart of a sun, if he's in the mood to fuck around and have a bit of villainous fun, that is. Otherwise, he can simply unravel everyone and go about his business. The fact that they have this scene makes every single battle against Thanos completely moot. Every battle is a fake, a cheesy time-filling gimmick, So any time Thanos is fighting, it's simply because, well, I don't know. He's not paying attention, he doesn't care, I don't know, but we can see very clearly he can do whatever he wants to, so why doesn't he? It's not a lack of imagination. He proves himself quite adept at using his power in that scene at the Collector's. And he thinks more quickly than Loki can lunge, so it's not like Thanos is slow, mentally or physically. Some say he fights because he enjoys it, and yet we never see any evidence of that. We never see him reveling in the battle. He doesn't exult when he trounces the Hulk. He binds the extremely powerful Thor rather than fight him, and that's not a battle he'd shy away from if he enjoyed battle, not after kicking Hulk's ass. He never says, I want to fight your best, or this is too easy, or is there no one powerful enough to challenge me, or other warrior shit like that. He never pounds his chest after a victory, then takes a dump on his fallen foe and scrambles up a tree. You're thinking of King Kong. No, I don't think so. 
So, why does Thanos engage in base fisticuffs when he has such tricks up his sleeve? The only possible reason Thanos doesn't actually use the vast power at his disposal to end every battle instantly is because it's inconvenient to the plot. The movie would end too soon, and we have a lot of battles and empty spectacle to throw in. I say empty spectacle because even though it looks good, I know Thanos winning is a foregone conclusion, and I'm not impressed by the context, which is absolute futility, or the execution, which is quick cut shaky cam directoral malpractice that gets incredibly tedious about 40 minutes in. It's hard to get all involved in this story when you know every battle is bullshit because Thanos is so powerful if he loses it's only because the script won't allow him to use his powers. Now it's interesting that once Thanos leaves, Drax and Mantis reassemble. Why? Why the hell would Thanos do that? It makes no sense at all. Thanos wants to kill half of the population while well, here's a few down. Now you could argue that he wants to do it totally randomly, so he repairs them to await that random judgment, which is an interesting and valid choice. Otherwise, this is a very cheesy signal on a meta level to audiences that despite all the death and defeat, this is one big con job, that everything will be set right, eventually. Of course, one could try to fix this gaping mortal wound of a plot hole by saying them crumbling and unraveling was only an illusion, like the earlier part where Gamera kills Thanos, only to realize that Thanos and the entire environment was an illusion. But again, if he has this immense and limitless power of illusion to where he can immobilize you by making you think you've unspooled, it leads us right back to the same exact objection. If he can do that, he can end attacks by making everyone think they're silly putty and Lego blocks. Or he can make them attack each other thinking they're fighting him, Battle effectively over again. He can certainly make the heroes run off and fight an illusion while he tiptoes through the tulips and gathers his stones while he may. So again, Thanos not using his power is a cheat. A cheat that forces you to dumb yourself down in order to ignore. We don't want it to be a cheat, so you have to ignore the evidence of your eyes and your rational mind. Doomcock cannot do that. Doomcock is a villain, and he goddamn well knows what he would do with that kind of power. Doomcock would face no opposition, receive no blow, have nary a hair disturbed by superhero resistance. All the heroes are fighting Doomcock's conjured illusions, those few not reduced into Marvel sugar cookies. If Thanos is that unimaginative, that stupid, that ineffectual, then how is Thanos a great villain? Thanos is an interesting case because he is given a great deal of character development, but to what end? Some responses to my previous video have been, that's what makes him a great villain, he's not cardboard, he's realistically presented, it's better to have a villain who believes himself to be a hero. I agree. All villains think of themselves as heroes. I certainly do. But I would argue it's not enough to thoroughly explore a villain's motives. A villain must be larger than life. He must be mysterious, because familiarity breeds contempt. Vader was perhaps the greatest film villain of all time. And what did we know of him? Diddly squat in the first trilogy, except he was a fallen Jedi Knight who betrayed the Jedi and destroyed them. We later learn he was Luke's father. That's it. But Vader had presence. Vader was grand. Every time he appeared on screen, it sent a jolt of adrenaline shooting through you. We didn't know his inner pain. We didn't know his past except in the sketchiest detail. He looked cool. He was a badass. He'd kill you in a second for minor infractions. He wanted to rule the galaxy. He said and did really cool shit. His every line was endlessly quotable, and he has endured for 40 years. That is a great villain. And yet, what did more knowledge of Vader do for us in the prequels? Did it deepen his legend? Hell no! 
When you see Vader as a kid going yippy and as a teen going creepy, when you see him whine about sand in his ass crack as he stalks Padme like a pervy puppy raised in a Tijuana whorehouse, it diminishes Vader. He was a larger-than-life operatic comic book villain, but when you've seen him whiny and sulky and ineffectual, it lessens his legend. And so it is with Thanos, in that revealing his motive so clearly, you've lessened his mystery and diminished his appeal as a villain. Plus, he cries. That doesn't help. My problem with Thanos is not that he's too well-developed. Character development is always good, but that he's not sufficiently villainous. The development he gets negates his mystery. That works against him. But the real problem is Thanos lacks the passion to be a great villain. One thing all great villains share is passion. Vader was zealous in his villainy. Doctor Doom is maniacal and ranting at the drop of a hat. Lex Luthor hates Superman with every fiber of his bald being. The Joker has the wild commitment of madness. And Thanos? He explains his motives reasonably, in a calm voice. Thanos sheds a tear for Gamora as he kills her tenderly. He doesn't kill any of our heroes with spite or venom, but out of calculation or necessity. And that's why Thanos is a mediocre villain. That lack of passion is why I resent him destroying the Marvel Cinematic Universe because I feel gypped. The MCU deserved a better death than one at the gauntleted hand of a fairly reasonable crackpot with egalitarian tendencies. In the comics, he was a mad, passionate titan, literally in love with death. Here, he's virtually a social justice warrior intent on killing everyone to ensure that social justice and ecological conservation prevail. Yawn. Thanos is basically a pretty nice guy, as villains go. Misguided, but decent. He wants to take over the universe to help end suffering. He's not driven by anger or aggrievement or revenge, all the cool motives that make a great villain fun to watch. He's basically a goddamn social justice warrior, people. The ultimate nanny stater, killing half the population because it's for the common good. He's making that decision for the universe instead of raging with fists raised against the storm on the battlement of his castle, vowing to make the world bow down to him. He's doing what he's got to do to help the universe. And that, regretfully. That's why he doesn't leave Mantis and Drax disassembled on the floor, honors his deal with Loki by not crushing Thor's head, doesn't kill Star-Lord. He's principled, and he wants to kill 50% in egalitarian fashion, rich and poor, young and old, without discrimination. There's much that's interesting and laudable about Thanos. He's an intriguing character, but he's not a hugely compelling villain. Indeed, seeing Thanos in this movie, the semi-sane and honorable way he behaves, it makes little sense that Gamera and her sister would hate him as much as they do if he had behaved like this all their lives. All of a sudden, he's sensitive, sheds a tear, which is it? They seem unable to decide what Thanos is, a horrible, selfish butcher, or a social justice warrior. Which is it? I couldn't tell you. But I damn well tell you I didn't get the same charge out of seeing him appear as I did, and still do, every time I see Vader stride down the corridor. It doesn't matter what Vader does, even knowing all the Anakin shit, even with Vader being diminished by that specter in the back of my mind, I still am obsessed with Vader. But Thanos, really, I understand the need of some to defend this film, because you've invested so much into it. You don't want it to be less than perfect, I get that. But ask yourself, in ten years, will Thanos' masks and figures and images be everywhere like Vader's? On coffee mugs and greeting cards and party balloons and cereal boxes? Or will he be largely forgotten, like Ronan? Better written... Better acted, yes, but basically only a notch or two above okay. And yet, 
as long as Star Wars toys are being made at all, Vader will be there. That's how you can tell a great villain, by the way he resonates across time and grips the imagination of young and old alike. Thanos isn't there as far as I'm concerned. If you search your feelings, you'll know this to be true. But I'll leave that aside for now. Thanos is one of the best villains in the MCU, but that's not saying a lot. And by God, if you're going to have a guy beat the entire Marvel Universe into submission and kill half the population of the universe, then God damn it, you better give us a villain who is better than just okay. Otherwise, what does that say about your beaten heroes? And therein lies the ultimate failure of this film. I've heard it said we can't judge this because it's the first movie of two parts. And yet I don't see part one in the title, and it's as long as a movie, and I had to pay full price for it, and I have to wait a year or more to see the next one. So yeah, I'm going to judge this movie as a movie as itself. There are two ways that this Infinity War arc can go. Depending on the second movie, I admit Infinity War could be an unparalleled triumph for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or it could be an abject failure, a crass exercise in cheesy hucksterism the likes of which we have seen too many times before in the comic book industry. Yeah, superheroes die all the time in comics, and then they come back. This is a movie, sure, but don't the same rules apply? It's no big deal, is it? Exactly. If these heroes are only temporarily dead, then death is no big deal in this universe, and no one can take it seriously anymore. But what happens to the reanimated hero and their show afterward? Let's examine a comic story that was made into a TV show, The Walking Dead. Remember Negan on The Walking Dead? Prior to Negan's appearance, The Walking Dead was the biggest hit on television. Then they brought Negan in, and what did he do? He beat the Walking Dead universe into submission. He dominated all the heroes, humiliated them, and beat Glenn to death right in front of them. They were rendered impotent in defeat, and the show has never recovered. They hemorrhaged viewers. They dropped out of the critical conversation because no one wants to see that shit. Life is full of humiliations, and when you've seen the characters you identify with completely destroyed on a show, it diminishes those characters forever in your eyes. Rick just isn't ever going to be the badass he was before Glenn got beaten to death in front of his eyes and after they spent a season or two bowing and scraping before Negan. Sure, it's a bold narrative move to take your franchise to such an extreme point, and yet... When you've metaphorically had to watch your treasured characters lick the shit off a villain's boot, you don't really see that hero the same way again. If you take the defeat of your heroes too far, when they get whipped like children, when you have to rely on narrative bullshit gimmicks just to bring them back to life, it severely damages your franchise. And so, here we find ourselves. Thanos thoroughly defeated the entire Marvel Universe. And that can't be taken back. Oh sure, there's another movie coming, and you could argue that this was Empire Strikes Back, but it's not. Yes, the heroes were on the ropes at the end of Empire, but that's just good storytelling. Heroes are supposed to recover from adversity, but there was hope of a victory. An honest victory, not a narrative lie, not a cheat. Han might yet be rescued. Luke might yet face Vader again. He wasn't exactly defeated. Indeed, by flinging himself off the platform, it was a moral victory, a demonstration of Luke's strength of character that Vader could not defeat. A strength of character that Jar Jar and Ryan Johnson completely discarded and shit on in their abortive abominations. But I must not digress. At the end of Empire, there is still hope of a redemptive ending. At the end of Infinity War, everyone has been defeated and half of everyone is dead. And that is quite a different thing. 
Marvel has negened its own universe. We've seen our heroes bested to a man, woman, and android. Thanos beat them all, fair and square. They failed, and half the universe is dead. And so what lies ahead? There are only two options. Either the survivors best Thanos and bring everyone back, in which case the film was a colossal and cynical lie that toyed with our emotions and wasted hours of our lives on a stunt, or everyone who is dead stays dead and we're deprived of some of our favorite characters forever. So let's look at option A. If they defeat Thanos and bring everyone back, then nothing in the MCU matters anymore. It's like Kirk being brought back from the dead with Khan blood. They do that, anyone can be brought back with more Khan blood, and so death is defeated in the Abrams verse. You can never again really take it seriously when some hero dies or even is faced with death. If you can pull something like this only to back away and bring everyone to life again, then this film is emotional porn. A manipulative and corrupted playing with the emotions of the audience, killing heroes for no reason other than shock value. When everyone has been defeated and has died, then returned from the dead or not, these characters are no longer the heroes they were. Now, how do you ever care again? After those ultimate stakes have been lost, only to be told, no, no, it's okay, gang, look, they're back. Just like when they killed Superman. It was a cheap marketing gimmick designed to shock, get publicity, and sell comics. But Superman came back in a bullshit tangled storyline, and everyone that stocked up on the bad death issues took a soaking because no one likes to buy a lie twice. So that way forward lacks integrity. We all witnessed the death of the Marvel Universe, but it was all a dream. Bobby Ewing is going to step out of the shower in the next movie, and everything will go on as it did before. Only it won't. Because our heroes have been broken. Just like Negan broke Rick and the gang. And Marvel has been revealed in that case to be crash showmen who when they kill someone it means nothing because they don't have the integrity to make it mean something. Because we know they're not going to stay dead. Oh, a few might stay dead. But really, if you doubt where this is going, you've got to be kidding yourself. Everyone knows when they kill the Guardians of the Galaxy, when they kill their newest cash cow, the Black Panther, kill Spider-Man, kill all those heroes whose contracts are not up for renewal, who are just starting out in their own franchises, you know Disney isn't going to let that ride. So all this death, all this tragedy, is just cynical manipulation. There will be a Black Panther 2, and a Spider-Man 2, and a Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and all of this was a Superman Dies stunt, and it makes Doomcock angry. Certain genres have certain expectations. I go to see Death of a Salesman if I want to feel dead inside. I go to a comedy if I want to laugh, and I go to a superhero movie to have fun. This shit wasn't fun. It just ends, just drops dead in its tracks, just like our characters. There's no follow-up, no denouement. We have to wait for another movie to get anything like a complete story. And what do we take away from this movie? We saw Hulk get his ass beaten so bad he hides the rest of the film. The Incredible Hulk is a fucking rampaging beast until the chips are really down. And then he gives up. We see Spider-Man cry like a baby at the coming of death. Never a good look for a hero. We have Star-Lord act like a total moron and fuck up the one chance they have to stop Thanos. Though not really, because when he can turn people into blocks and ribbons with a thought, not pumping his fist or blinking like Genie or wiggling his nose like Samantha, but with thought, or we would have seen him fist pumping and twitching and wiggling the whole movie, that whole scene was silly. Someone in my forums mentioned uh, that Thanos needed to close his fist to use his power. This is a misinterpretation of the scene. 
Thanos didn't need to close his fist to use his power. Doctor Strange was merely telling them not to let him close his fist in that scene because they were trying to get his gauntlet off. If he closed his fist, they wouldn't be able to get it off. Mantis clouding his mind and relaxing his thoughts is what kept Thanos from using his powers. Closing his hand had nothing to do with it. And so, Thanos wins. And so, the Death Star destroys Yavin. And I ask... Is that a good movie? The whole point of a superhero comic movie is to see how the hero prevails. It may be hard. It may be costly. Gwen Stacy or Bucky Barnes may die. But there's only a story if the heroes prevail. How about a movie where the villain ties the girl to the railroad tracks and the train runs her over? Hero is too late. Or it's a race against time to keep London from getting blown up. But London gets blown up, we see everyone die, and look sad, the end. Absent some kind of assessment of the hero in such instances, of what he's learned, and what tragic failing in his character prevented his victory without those elements lending a dramatic interest to the failure, the movie becomes nothing more than a snuff film, an empty exercise in nihilism and defeat. Yea, Marvel. That's not really why I go to see a comic book movie. So what of option B? What if everyone who died stays dead? Well, if Marvel keeps everyone dead, if none of the heroes are reanimated, if the MCU remains decimated, then Doomcock must admit that this raises the stakes almost beyond reckoning. In that event, Infinity War is a work of bold genius, a once-in-a-lifetime act of corporate courage, an elevation of storytelling integrity above corporate profit, the likes of which we have never seen. Were that to happen, stakes in the MCU would be raised in every subsequent movie to a level no other franchise has ever attained, an artistic triumph unparalleled in the history of modern cinema. But it will also be a terrible loss, because Doomcock will never get to see his beloved Guardians of the Galaxy again in all their dysfunctional glory. Black Panther fans will never see him again, nor Spider-Man, nor any of our lost heroes. And Infinity War will have to be reevaluated as a tragic masterpiece and watched again and saluted. And when we will watch it again, we will have to grieve. Truly grieve as we did not watching it the first time. Truly saying goodbye to these heroes we have loved. And that will be a day of agony. Realizing the finality of death in our entertainment as we do in our lives. As everything we love eventually corrupts to dust. But that's not going to happen, is it, Harvey? Fuck no, Dector. Oh, leaving all that Black Panther money on the table? What are you, high? No, just moderately drunk. Of course that's not going to happen. You think Marvel Disney is going to give up billions of dollars from Guardians of the Galaxy and Black Panther and Spider-Man sequels when they're just getting started? Maybe Thor and Iron Man want to call it quits. I don't know the details of their contracts. But if you think a corporation is going to surrender all those profits to make an artistic statement, you may be suffering a stroke. That's right. Slurred speech, disorientation, paralysis, and doubting corporations want to make money are warning signs. Call 911 if you're experiencing hallucinations about corporate artistic integrity immediately. And so we come to this. If they bring the heroes back, then Infinity War is not only a downer, it is an immense miscalculation that the MCU will never recover from. These are superhero movies, and superheroes are supposed to triumph. They can be beaten down. They can be discouraged. They can have crises of faith. They can be depressed. They can renounce their powers. But at the end of the day, they cannot be defeated and still remain heroes. They come back. Hulk is always going to be the punk that ran away when the going got tough. And Spider-Man is a crybaby. And every hero got their asses handed to them by a mediocre villain not fit to hold Vader's cape. And if they don't come back, then we hail the genius of this movie 
and the integrity of its artistic vision, even as we mourn the passing of some of our favorite movie heroes. I don't see any good way out of this for Marvel. I don't think the Marvel Universe will ever be the same. And unless everyone stays dead, Infinity War infinitely screwed the cosmic pooch. This is Dictor Van Doomcock, broadcasting from Zena Doom at the center of the Earth, exhorting you all, my friends, as always, stay angry. Ha, 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 ha.